I am intelligent and creative. I am bold and determined. I rely on teamwork and I am accountable. I am a competitor who will defend my territory. I love to play and will never give up. I am committed for life because I am a raven. And howdy, howdy, howdy is one of my favorite podcasts starts out with. This is episode nine of the Thursday Night Live, the season finale. And we've got after a lot this year. And one of the things we didn't do is we, we didn't do a, a podcast type feel for the program. And we thought it might be a good idea at the end of the year to 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 look back on, on the season, as it were, uh, go from episode to episode um, relive some of the the glory and some of the you know some of the some of the times it wasn't wasn't so great and some of the times when it was really really quite amazing and you know put a put a bow on things honestly for the year as as you would do at you know at this time of the year and I'm happy obviously to be joined once again by uh, MC Extraordinaire the one the only Jeff Morris Jeff how are you welcome to back to the Thursday Night Live how are things. Things are great, and it's uh, it's great to be back for for one uh, kind of year end year end show. It's uh, it's been an incredible year. Yeah, it has been a, a lot of fun, and um, we're going to spend quite a bit of time just sort of rolling through the clips, uh, whatnot of the program. And um, I'm just wondering, um, before we were to to do that, was there um, sort of anything that you kind of wanted to to say or to launch for this? momentous occasion to you know wrapping up the, the season of the Thursday Night Live well I think the one thing we we really haven't done is uh uh you know our our, uh, our tech extraordinaire Colin uh behind the scenes we haven't really brought him out into the forefront and and uh talked about you know people people watch the broadcast they see us talking us interviewing people and they don't realize how much work goes in uh, behind the scenes, so let's let's bring uh, let's bring Colin out and let him uh, talk about how the show has evolved, not um, not content wise, but but production wise. Hey, so so come on out of your hiding spot, there, Colin. I'm out of my <laughs> hiding spot. <laughs> Live and, and of course, you, you know, we we we've also always joked about how uh, um, Thursday Night Live, the movie, Ed Sheeran is under contract to play Colin, so. So, uh, so, so, I mean, our, our female demographic is going to skyrocket for that. So obviously we thank, you, we thank you for that. So, so that'll be good. But, um, the, the, uh, tell us a little bit about how it's been, uh, as the show has evolved, uh, through the months behind the scenes and, and what, what that whole journey has been like for you. Yeah. Um, right now, the way the show's looking at the moment, there's a lot that goes into it. And, and when we started out, it wasn't so much, you know, um, the very first shows and, and we're lucky, I think, tonight to get a, a look at the whole uh, run of, of the shows and through some clips. Uh, and the first couple shows were just in a Zoom meeting, like uh, just very rudimentary. Everybody log on and we'll have a chat. And then from there, we sort of upped the production value one one step at a time. And, and eventually we got to where we are now and 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 i'm particularly proud of last month where we did a a live in-person broadcast with all sorts of setup and you'll see some more details on that later but right now it's i'm i like i've had such a great opportunity to level up my skills and and work with uh with you guys on this and and uh yeah it's it's been a fun run (laughs) so far when when you look when you look back at all the clips over the last eight months, is there a little bit of a wow factor? Like, uh, like, oh my gosh, we've come a long way. And is there a little bit of a cringe factor? Like when you look at the first one or two thinking, oh my God, we were way back there. Like we've come so far. Like, like, 
like when when did you kind of realize like wow we've really we're really getting better at this yeah absolutely i mean the the original like the original clips there's it's just <laughs> Like I said, a couple cameras on a black background because that's all you can do when you're recording in Zoom, and and yeah, I, I cringe at that a little bit because yeah, I've spent so so long in Zoom over over the past year or so. <laughs> um, and funny enough, we're still using Zoom for conferencing now, but it's you know it's great to uh, kind of break out of that mold and have a more uh, animated and uh, and involved show. Um, yeah. In that first episode by Zoom, the one thing I remember is that so much of it was on the fly because we had coaches from different teams scheduled at certain times. Well, one coach is scheduled for for uh, five fifteen, but he won't be able to join us till five thirty, and and then all of a sudden he's there at five fifteen, and, and and like everything was on the fly, and and so many moving parts, and and. Uh, uh, I know it was extremely difficult for me interviewing them because I had questions prepped for everybody and all of a sudden the order would change. Like in 15 seconds, it's going to be somebody different and I'm scrambling for notes. And, and was it was it like that for you behind the scenes? Because I know it was difficult. Absolutely. Um, I don't want to rag on you too much, Trevor, but <laughs> your, your, your pre-production schedule skills um, weren't, weren't the best at the very beginning. <laughs> we had some Definitely rough not. blocks of things and... And yeah, there was a whole lot of behind the scenes switching around for me and reacting. And lucky for you, that's that's what I like to do. That's that's why I'm in this in this game, putting together shows like this. But um, yeah, for sure, there was a it was a rough rough and bumpy road, but um, we got we got there in the end. We we got some great and, production and, under uh, our belt. And and the the schedules that we worked on were detailed to the minute. And, and we did a pretty good job on, on getting, you know, the show was going to be from five to six and we had a pretty good uh, system to get the show wrapped up by like five fifty nine fifty nine. 59, 59. And, <laughs> and uh, I guess when we, I guess when we talk about episode eight, uh, we'll get into the scheduling um, and you're going to show us a diagram of, of the schedule. And of course, the one thing we're all wondering, and this is, this is what we talk about with you every week is, is uh, uh, how do you get the birds lined up in, in the logo? Uh, and and uh, um, how do you how did you make that happen with with uh, um, you know you know did you give a signal for them to all explode at once or, or was it a, was it a hand thing or how did how did you get that done? It's a real pain. It's a real pain. There's some uh, <laughs> whistles involved, and and you know just just five minutes ago I changed out of my um, bird poop covered uniform. <laughs> <laughs> It's all now, now speaking out. about the speaking about the intro, um, Trevor, I know you have uh, uh, you know the intro is just something that sort of runs at the beginning of the show. Maybe people put some thought into it, maybe they don't. Um, but but what uh, um, tell us a little bit about how that intro came to be and and uh, how it evolved? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one because we get, I get a lot of questions about that and. We talk about the process and and the evolution of the program and and certainly the you know the very beginnings of the program. I, I can give like a hundred percent of the credit for that that video um, to Christina Chenard um, in advancement because when I came in, they were like, you know, twenty twenty has been a rogue wave that's really killed us in athletics. Like, there's no games, there's nothing to talk about. Let's get a conversation rolling and i think right in the beginning before i approached you guys uh, one of the very first meetings we had christina said just look at this video you know and tell me what you think about it and just let it ruminate on it and think about how maybe we could use it and then i started thinking about you know, how can we cannibalize this thing and use it for our own you know selfish needs and so I, I reached out to the person that had made it, the president of the company, and he shared some really cool stories about how it was made. They had a professional drone flyer that flew it up the tower like 150 kilometers an hour um, and was flying all over the campus. And, and it was just really incredible. And one of the things that I thought was really cool was um, when I looked at the end product, the thing that really resonated with me and I thought, oh, well, this is going to work perfect for us is 
how much time it spent over the fields and over athletics and over the rinks. And I was like, this is custom made for us. And I said, like, what, what was the, what was the driver behind that for you? You know, and he said, that wasn't even part of the shoot. He was literally leaving one day. Um, it's funny to get these backstories, but he was just leaving the campus and he thought, Oh, you know what? I'm just going to take it out of the trunk real, real quick. And as he was driving out of on Bronson Avenue and get some shots of the field. And he had done some pretty cool spirals down on the, the center of the field, which we never used, but he said, and, and it was kind of this last second decision from the trunk of his car to do this whole sweep across athletics that just was, was a miracle for us because it just worked perfect for the program. So um, I thought when we were envisioning a beginning and an end, I thought this is a, this is perfect. And it really kind of makes us look, look this made us look kind of really shiny um, and, and get and put the wind in our wings for the beginning of every show. And um, yeah, we were, there's a fine line between courage and crazy for sure, because um, we, we were courageous to take it on and do it fly by the seat of our pants, literally using that video as the push off point and then just dive right into sort of, you know, a first program, like, like Colin said, we, we kind of knew what we wanted. Uh, I know I had reached out to you guys in February. Um, I, we, I'd been thinking about what the program could be for about a month by that point. And then, then it was, and I remember the first sort of touches I had with Colin, he's like, um, and I think he literally did this, rubbed his head and he's like, okay, I think I know where, what you sort of want. And I said, uh, yeah, I think I have an idea too. And then I reached out to Jeff and Jeff's like, yeah, man, like I'm into it totally. Like I'm podcasting all the time and I'm into this. Yeah, let's do it all. So we had Jeff's, Je- Jeff had a lot of energy. Colin had a lot of anxiety. Um, I, <laughs> I was creating these schedules and then we just dove right in. And the first season, if I might just sort of switch gears here, the first season like, was kind of framing the year. Or it's not the first season, sorry, the first episode um, and it was really the training wheels episode for the year. And there were some glitches and some things that didn't work right. But, um, and so like, we're going to look at a couple of the clips here and, and you'll see some of the, um, you know, some of the, uh, you know, short steps or shortfalls of the program. And that's fine. That, that's where we were at that point. Um, and, but I think the thing that we're going to kick it off here is, is with, is with, um, and Colin had talked about was a clip where uh, Jennifer Branning, who who gave her her time um, so generously through the whole entire thing and embraced it, you know, she said, yeah, okay, yeah, let's just do something, you know, because we need, we need to get a conversation going. And she just dove right on this thing and ran with it. And um, I'll let that be as sort of the intro for, for the first clip. It is easy to stay closed and it is incredibly hard to stay open. But it is so important that we open for the physical and mental health of our community. I'll give you an example. We opened summer camp registration on February 19th, and by noon of that day, we were 70% sold out, demonstrating the confidence of our community in our programs, as well as this pent up demand for activity. It is a full credit to our full time, part time staff and coaches and our amazing team. They are our frontline workers. We are looking. So the thing that when I, when I see that clip and the reason when I added this clip is, is because you can, it's, it's very, it's very stiff and, and the, the visuals are, are not there. We hadn't got there yet, but it, it was like kind of like a, a marching orders clip and it was so pandemic um, and heavy. They come over such a heavy time and, and for me, when I saw it, I thought you could you could feel the sense of uh, pressure that Jen was under at that time. Yeah, it seemed it, her her tone and her delivery seemed almost political. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, when you look back at that clip, and and you know, you you hear that uh, the programs were seventy percent full right away. Um, it it brings us back to a time when we were so. Uh, cooped up and so desperate to be uh, together again in an athletic forum of any kind. And it also, it also speaks to the point of how, you know, when we talk about 
our varsity programs in athletics, sometimes we leave out the peripheral stuff that is so important and that, you know, the junior Ravens programs and the camps and the, and the, uh, all the other things for all the sports are so crucial to the, uh, to the program. And, and I mean, yeah, our varsity athletes miss competing, but you know what? The 12 year old kids who are the future athletes, they miss the camps, they miss developing, they miss, everything that goes uh, that goes with it. They miss the thrill that the, the kids that play basketball that are 12 that look up to the Ravens, they miss the thrill of, you know, being taught by these guys. Um, so, so it, it uh, yeah, you can, you can read so many things into, uh, into a comment like that. And, and then we, we, we took it from there and we went right to Paul Armstrong because we wanted to get community champions involved. And, and really we thought, who else do we ask? But, like uh, the, one of the faces of, of the place, right? And we got a great clip of, of Paul here speaking on the first show too. He is Carlton Athletics, none other than our very own Paul Armstrong. Paul? Well, hi, Jennifer. Thanks so much for having me on. And like all of us, I am really missing watching our Ravens teams play this year. Well, I guess the theme today is uh, recruiting and uh, some of the coaches will be talking about that and return to play, of course. And they've asked me to say a few words on recruiting from an historical perspective as coach of both the women's uh, uh, basketball team, the Robins, A. Robins, in the early 80s, and of course the men's team from the late 80s to the late 90s. Um, so we, we were showing our warts a little bit there too with the visuals. You know, we hadn't really figured out the toys and how to, to switch. And, and, you know, and you can see that there's a couple of warts there. But it was really great to have Paul on to to set the tone and he really embraced it. And then speaking of, of training wheels and speaking about the pandemic, the next, I think the next clip kind of gets into that a little bit too. Sorry about that. I, I was muted. Um, uh, Paul, I'm glad you didn't tell the story of when I was Rodney the Raven uh, at the basketball games when you were coaching. I was playing football. I think I might be the only Rodney the Raven that ever got a technical foul. So. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> Good one. And I wanted to include that too, Jeff, and then because if if nothing says pandemic, it's the very first time you joined the show, and the first thing you said was, "Oh, sorry, I was muted." Like it's a, like nobody ever said that before the pandemic, and it was the very first thing you said, and it was just I think it was so apropos of twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one. So um, yeah, that was that was kind of cool. And I think uh, I think I had a I'm sorry I thought. I didn't know I was muted moment yeah. probably three shows in a row before, uh, before we got it right. And even, you know, we all live in a, in a world where we're on multiple zoom meetings and there's not a meeting that goes by still where somebody forgets to unmute themselves. Yeah. And, and, and it's, uh, and it's great. And, and, you know, it's funny thinking back of, uh, uh, you know, re remembering being the first Rodney, the Raven in the, in the eighties at the basketball games. And I had all my props, uh, I had a, a, a white cane and a seeing eye chart from my doctor. And if the referee made a bad call, I went right out on the court and held the eye chart in front of him. And that's what I got, that's what I got the technical foul for. And, and, um, and, and I mean, Carlton won by 30 anyways, but, but I'm sure Paul wasn't uh, too happy <laughs> with that at the time. He seemed to think it was funny, but I, I often said, to, I often said to people that, I'm going to see you in the Glebe on Bank Street at some point. And the first thing I can say to you is you're muted. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're <laughs> yeah. totally getting sick of that for sure. Um, the next clip, we get into the the actual coaches circle. So um, the theme for the show was was town hall. So we're trying to get as many of the people in, in there as possible, talking about what it's like to motivate players and, and think about try to be together without being together and, and do recruiting and training and such. And uh, I think the next clip really speaks to the essence of the Thursday Night Live and really hit the hit the main vein in terms of what we want to accomplish. accomplish. So, so how are some of these uh, players going to fit in uh, and impact the team uh, both immediately and long term? Well, I mean, the thing we always look to focus on when we're, we are recruiting players is how they're going to impact our environment, right? We want to look at the culture that we're trying to build. We want to look at the competitiveness of our program and just ensuring that they, they fit the mold and philosophy of what we're trying to accomplish. So, so these three players, you know, with the pedigree that they have, 
I mean, they're already coming from a successful environment. We hope that they're looking to bring that here to our to our program as well. And, you know, like like anything else, we want that to be infectious and that to spread amongst all the other players who we have now currently and and the players we are looking to bring in in, in the upcoming years as well. Hey, we'll move into the ice house now. We'll talk about the hockey teams. Pierre Alain was with us, the, the Ravens women's hockey coach. Um, the team posted some really big wins in the 2019-2020 season. Um, and again, how, how were you able to keep moving forward? The team was improving, improving. Um, but hockey's a little bit different because ice time is so limited compared to uh, some of the other sports where a lot of the work is in the gym. How, how have you been able to kind of keep the players engaged and move forward, Pierre? We're very fortunate to uh, very fortunate to have uh, three on ice practices, and the, and the girls are also working with um, Nick Westcott off ice. But uh, to be quite uh, frank, uh, like we're we're fortunate because uh, I've spoke with our colleagues uh, in the RSEQ, and the last time they were on the ice was uh, early November. So I told the players like we got to take advantage of this and. Uh, Let's uh, let's improve. Let's work on let's work on skills. Let's work on on even team cohesion because we've doing we've we've been doing some tactics and, and stuff on the ice that will uh, will prepare the team for next year. With uh, actually with eight new players in the lineup uh, this this year uh, and eight coming next year, so uh, we're gonna have a young team, but very exciting. And yes, I agree with you. Uh, milestone last year. We've beat McGill Powerhouse uh, first time in regulation in, in the history of the program. Same uh, with uh, Montreal. We've beat them uh, in overtime. That was the first ever win against Montreal in overtime and uh, also beat number one in the country, uh, Concordia. So, yeah, very excited to, uh, to, uh, for the upcoming season. The, the thing that I really liked about <clears throat> this clip was he said t team cohesion and it was so gratifying to be able to to give the coaches a voice because it was like people talk about the athletes and they talk about the um you know the the alumni and it's tough not to be together um but the toughest role is being the coach and trying to you know organize those people and keep them motivated and we heard that over and over again in the coaches circle and one of the things, too, is remember back to that time, uh, this year, uh, everybody's there. Everybody's practicing. But back then, some people were in Ottawa. Some people were at the school. Some people were at home. Some people were living with their parents. Some people were in little apartments, and, and nobody could leave. And, and when you talk to the coaches, uh, Kwesi said something really interesting. And, and, and where we really saw recruiting last year was – Coaches recruited on personality and chemistry more than ever before because that was really the only indicator they had. And, and uh, so it became a huge thing. And Pierre talks about um, how young his team is going to be. Here he is the, into this season, into the 21-22 season. He dresses 20 players per game and 15 of them are playing their first games for the Ravens this year. So he only has five players on his, on his, in his roster. Uh, dressing for games that have played for the Ravens before this season and they're doing well they're competing and they're winning some games so uh, yeah. it, it's it's phenomenal how how quickly the the turnaround can come but but I mean those coaches did a great job in in team building and I, I think with with any show you have to do the town hall so we did that and we gave everybody a voice and and a pulpit, which was great. And I think we did that well. And we struggled through some of the, you know, some of the funny uh, technical glitches and things, which we weren't afraid to show here. Um, but this, the episode two was the first time we engaged our first substantive topic. And when we were thinking about what that ought to be now, keeping in mind, um, we're trying to, we're trying to offer something here where in the absence of games, we have we don't have things to talk. We don't have a game to talk about. So, um, how can we how can we use the time productively to think about uh, like a substantive topic and and give a platform to something that's super important, which was the episode episode two, uh, the big idea inclusion, diversity, equity, allies, and there was no other no bigger um, champion or I would say you know the, the, who epitomized leadership um, 
in certainly in the modern era for Carlton than Osvaldo Genti. And, and we were so honored to have him here in this club. I'm now joined by a man who needs no introduction on the Carlton University campus. Carlton Athletic Hall of Famer Osvaldo Genti led the Ravens basketball team to five straight U Sports national championships. He the first in the first five in the program's history. He was the MVP in three of the five championship games. He was a two-time Final Eight MVP, a two-time CIS Player of the Year, a two-time First Team First Team All Canadian, and was once a Second Team All Canadian. He played for the Canadians Men's National Team and played professionally in Germany, Romania, Morocco, and back in Canada. A native of Haiti, Osvaldo moved to Canada at the age of six and quickly fell in love with sports. He played soccer, baseball, football, and volleyball before focusing on basketball. So um, Osvaldo's interview was an example of one of the ones where we were really challenged technically and his internet was bad and this has been a theme through the entire 2021 and the editing job that that Colin um, did to pull that together in the end was he was like an athletic therapist in the back end like taping it all together so they could get out there and play so uh, he did a really good job with that. Um, we also took the opportunity to uh, to get a visit from one of our champions on the campus who wasn't necessarily in athletics, but worked with the entire campus to work in, in equity. And uh, he, he talked about the, you know, the galvanizing factor of sports on our, uh, on our campus and how it, you know, it brings to be, brings together a lot of people. And um, there's a clip from him here, which I thought was really strong. Um, I'm honored to be here today and happy to, to contribute what I can to this conversation and to add value um, to uh, this ongoing discussion that we're having around equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, I could come here and, and stand and then have a conversation about, you know, this is what I do and this is what Carlton's doing and those sorts of pieces, but that wouldn't be as fun. Um, so I want to try something a little bit different. Um, and I want to start with something that we can all relate to, and that's sports. And that's what we're here to talk about today as well. So if you can go to the next slide, I want to share something. So here we have this notion, and I'm sure everyone has heard this before, right? This idea that sports has the power to change the world, and it does. And this is something that um, we all are aware of, is something that we're all known for and something that we've heard a million times before. What a lot of folks don't know is who said this quote and where it comes from. Uh, the full quote is, sports has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language that they understand. Sport can be, um, can create hope where one where there was despair and it is more powerful than governments and breaking down racial barriers. Uh, and this quote actually comes from the great Nelson Mandela um, who, for those of you who don't know, was a prolific boxer in South Africa and obviously uh, a social justice and civil rights leader. Um, and when I hear this quote, uh, I know that it's true. I know that the power that sports have, um, I'm a big sports fan myself. We the North Raptors all the way. Uh, and of course, Ravens. Uh, and what really stands out to me is these three different components when we talk about this quote and when we talk about sport. It's this idea of a goal, right? Working together towards a common goal, which is something that a lot of sports are about. We're all kind of working towards a common objective and goal together. Then there's this notion of a team working together with others to achieve that goal, collaborating, coming together, sharing ideas, sharing perspectives. And then there's this idea of community, right? Which is this concept of not just coming together as a team, but sharing our perspectives wider with those around us, giving people something to believe in, giving some people something to rally around. Um, and that's what EDI means to me. It's all around goals, teams, and communities. So if we go to the next so I, I thought that was a really great take. Um, and when we thought about not just the, the game that we play, but the, the global community, uh, the, the notion of, of equity and looking at it as an academic exercise, um, because we do marry academics and students and sports on our campus. And, and any, uh, any take away from that, Jeff? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, First of all, shout out to uh, Chouetten Blacksmith, a Cree player from the Carlton Ravens hockey team a couple of years ago, who just signed a pro contract in Sweden. He's going to be the only Cree player uh, playing in the Swedish Division Two league, and, and it's great to see oh, our athletes true. move on to to, uh, to to pro teams. And and um, 
when you talk about, you know, it's interesting he, he had that quote from Nelson Mandela because in my opinion, there are the three most important men of the 20th century globally are one, Jackie Robinson, uh, two, Jesse Owens, and three, Nelson Mandela. And I had the privilege of working on the sideline at a Dallas Cowboys game when Nelson Mandela uh, was in Dallas and he sat with, um, he sat with, it was President Bush at the time and, and uh, in a box with the owner of the Cowboys in Texas Stadium. And they, he was introduced and shown on the Jumbotron. And I mean, this was fairly recently after his release from prison in South Africa. And for all of the sports events I've been to in my world, in the, in the world, in my lifetime, I had never heard innovation that loudly. Uh, it was it was deafening, and and it lasted and lasted and lasted. And when you look at the way Jackie Robinson changed the world, when you look at the way Jesse Owens uh, changed the world, you know, winning those gold medals in, in front of Adolf Hitler. Uh, when you look at what M Nelson Mandela did and represented, and it was a sports theater that 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 brought people to him. Uh, extremely powerful, and and it really shows. Uh, you, you know, we we came a long way in the 20th century, but not nearly far enough. But the 21st century, I think, uh, with the events that have been happening, as far as diversity and equity, uh, we're we're light years ahead uh, of, of uh, and things are speeding up so fast in, in those areas. And, and a lot of it is because of the groundwork laid by those three men. And and I would I would go on to say that the the groundwork is still being laid by the preemptive action of of the youth that are coming up and the student athletes. And I think that's a segue to the notion of preemptive action and the varsity committees that that Carlton, you know, boldly went ahead and and created and and um, and brought together. And we got a clip now about uh, with respect to the great work that was that's been done at Carlton Athletics on, on that front mentioned when I was talking about the kind of the intro part like uh, Cheryl and yourself really started the gender equity committee last year um, kind of before the pandemic happened um, and um, so how has it differed from kind of the start of the subcommittee to what you've been doing now? Yeah so when it started um, it was kind of just a lot of female athletes being angry and yelling about issues that we felt were, were happening um, globally, you know, and, you know, at the youth sports level and the university level. And as we know, there's lots of barriers that women and LGBTQ plus athletes face and university sports not immune to those issues. Um, so it started out as kind of a space for us to have open dialogue with administration and athletics about things that we wanted to see on campus and things we wanted to see changed. And now it's kind of transformed into this like awesome, powerful committee where we run events and, host workshops and, and we post educational resources and we, we uh, had some really awesome head coach interviews and assistant coach interviews earlier in the fall kind of one of our first projects we got off the ground and we're planning a women in sport leadership conference for next year which is super super exciting COVID permitting um, anti-discrimination training for LGBTQ plus athletes um, which is going to be the first of its kind uh, you know in, in the youth sports as far as we know so yeah it started started kind of a conversation now it's transformed into, into preemptive action, which is super, super exciting. That's excellent. This marked a, a moment in the Thursday Night Live when we literally engaged staff um, like Nadine, who did a fabulous job to, to turn turn as an interviewer to one of the athletes uh, and, uh, and, and did it with, uh, and did it with Roberta. And uh, that was a very proud moment for me to see to see them be able to uh, to join the show and and literally lead a segment, which was 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 super super cool. And once again, I can't thank Nadine and Roberta enough uh, for doing that. And it's it's uh, it's interesting too, as as we've evolved in opportunities for women, we're we, we we're seeing women in management positions in the last couple of years uh, in baseball, in in uh, in. in in hockey and football, we're seeing it everywhere, basketball. And it's interesting because, you know, a few years ago, um, I think there was a, I think there was a feeling of uh, let's give a woman an opportunity, especially in broadcasting, let's give a woman an opportunity just so that we can say we gave a woman an opportunity. Now the women are getting opportunities because they're very good. And, and I think that that initial, uh, that initial, Hey, we're filling a quota is gone. 
completely. And and you know, we're seeing that when you watch when you watch Hockey Night in Canada, you see Cassie Campbell. She's she's excellent. You see some of the other uh, broadcasters. So, uh, I listen to New York Yankees baseball all the time. Susan Waldman is is their is their color commentator, and she has been for years. She's one of the best in the business. And and it's it's those barriers are 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 getting smashed every year, and it's and it's great to see. And um, we dedicated a show to that. We're going to get after you here in a second too. Um, and one of the things that one of the proudest moments I think for the Thursday Night Live, one of the amazing things that we were able to do here was to um, is to literally say we're going to turn the the keys of the program over to the student athletes, and that's exactly what we did in season three with the grad show. And uh, we'll we'll kick off a uh, we started to get a little cocky maybe little swagger in our step uh and we said you know let, let's just let's give the program to the students they they probably know more about this than we do so let's let them fly and that's exactly what we did so we'll roll with the first clip so sit back recline your seats lower your tray tables here's your audio pilot for the next hour ricky comba uh ricky tell us about yourself and the program ahead and have a great show thank you thank you I'm very happy to be here. Yes, my name is Ricky Kamba. I'm a fourth year journalism student and member of the men's varsity soccer team. I'm super excited to be here and we've got a great show for you. It's a grad show. It's a water celebration. So uh, we've got a few things going on that you'll, that you'll enjoy, I'm sure. Now to kickstart the program, it is my honor to introduce the Carleton president and chair of Canadian New Sports, Benoit Bacon, to say a few words of welcome. Good evening. Bonsoir tout le monde. I'm Benoit Antoine Bacon. It's my real pleasure to welcome you to Thursday Night Live as both president of Carleton University and as chair of U Sports. It's an honor to be here with you, our community of alumni, season ticket holders, fans and friends of Carleton Athletics to celebrate the resiliency and dedication of our graduating Ravens. When I look back at the schedule for that one, um, it's it's anybody who did a um, a television show or a podcast and sometimes to look back on them and go, what were we thinking? Like there was so much involved. There was way too heavy. I remember a lot of people saying that agenda, you'll never get it done in an hour. We have Ricky, Ricky's rapid fire Ravens rewind the president of the university student athletes hosting the show. And, um, but I, I for me, that was one of my favorite ones because of all of that. They did a fantastic job. And, and, uh, and you know, you, as a former varsity athlete, I can't. You can't help but think, "Wow, I wish they had something like that." Uh, and I got an opportunity back then when 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 I played uh, to do something like that. But and, and then I thought about it again, and it's like I wouldn't have been anywhere near the caliber of of uh, of those student athletes and what they did. They were absolutely lights out, fantastic. Ricky did a phenomenal job, and uh, you know. It just it just goes to show that uh, uh, not not just how good athletes, how good students are, but they're they're so well rounded and talented in many ways. They're great communicators, and mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was it was just a joy to watch them kind of take over for an hour and uh, uh, really really good job. Yeah, and and we see them on the field, and we forget that they they are they're juggling so many, so many things like so much you know and they have these these futures that they're worried about it was really a lot of fun to be able to let them to, to take it logan marks uh doing a whole intermission show on on uh water at, at carlton it, it was just amazing and uh the next clip it talks about some of the things that they that they'll, re they'll remember going out and then one last question for you what are you going to miss the most Hmm. I don't know, like you're only a varsity athlete once in your entire life. So all of it, like I'm, I'm going to miss training camp, you know, even though it's, it's hot as heck and you hate every minute of it. I'm going to miss, you know, getting treated in athletic therapy when you're holding back tears, when Nadine has her, her elbow in your butt. Just, <laughs> I'm going to miss it all. I'll miss pre-games, I'll miss the games, I'll miss the wins, I'll miss the losses. But um, I think those moments before you head out, head out onto the field, <clears throat> I was the captain last year and the year before, so I get to do a little pregame speech and like hype everybody up. And there's this like sense of calm that kind of comes over everybody right before we head out of the ice house, you know, when we have home games. And I'm the last, I'm always the last person out the door. I like make it my mission to be the last out the door. I watch everyone get onto the field and 
I smack the ice house door as a way of saying like, like, let's go. And then I run out onto the field. So I think like that moment right before we hear the music, right before I run out onto the field and I see my teammates like lined up in front of me, that's, that's the one feeling I'm going to miss definitely like the most. Mm -hmm. Those few moments, those few moments right before, right before we get to play are some of the best ones, that anticipation of just being able to go out on the pitch. Now, I know easily one of the my favorite clips from the entire season um you can feel the you can feel that energy and um almost getting a little choked up thinking about they're going to graduate and, and not be able to get to do all those little uh little things again and jeff you've been down these roads and on these buses and with these teams um what did what did, what does that what did that do for you to hear them talking about that from the heart it brought back memories. It brought back a lot of memories. It, it, it was like, I remember five minutes before going out in the field, listening to a, a cassette in my Sony Walkman. And, and, uh, and it's funny, you know, like, like, uh, and if Roberta and Ricky are, are watching the show, those are moments you're going to miss because that's when the adrenaline level was at, at its peak. And I still dream about that. I still have dreams 30 years later. I have dreams where those moments are, are, are there it, and it's so so it never leaves you and and uh um it, it it's just but 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 watching this it's just you, you can just see you just feel the uh, the energy coming out of them and and, and again uh, roberta and ricky did a fantastic job in that show yeah they, yeah they were they were totally wearing their heart and their sleeve there it's almost like they forgot that they were you know uh, on this show they were just talking and they were like yeah man i really get that and when i saw the clip i thought there's probably a lot of alum that you know that we get the feels, you know, and they, when they see that having played sports myself, I, I have a sense of it, but so much time and dedication and time together and little, you know, little things that you do before the game that nobody get to see. Right. So um, the thing we did in this program that, and which, um, which was really very cool was something that we, we introduced called the Ravens rewind and um, Cole Lawrence in the, uh, in athletics, who who has just such a keen eye for this kind of thing, created this uh, the Ravens rewind for us, and and I thought for us, um, we were very lucky to get his expertise, and uh, you'll get a sense of it here in this clip. This is Ravens rewind. Welcome to the official reveal of Ontario Post-Secondary Esports. In case you haven't heard already, the Ravens were a founding member in the new Ontario Post-Secondary Esports League. This league includes 17 Ontario colleges and universities including Carleton, Uottawa, Queens, Western and more. Uh, Cole did a really good job of making us look really, really good. Um, and we, we'd always thought... Man, it'd be really cool if this was like one of those professional sports shows, and he brought it. He he was he's he's gifted, and uh, uh, I mean I, I loved it because uh, you know ha having a background with Fox Sports Radio, I loved the music that he <laughs> picked. Obviously the the, mm -hmm. the the Fox music, but but I mean you know a lot of the uh, if you follow C Carlton on social media. Uh, you see the you see the great memes and the great graphics. That's all done by Cole, and he does a fantastic job. And and boy, having him uh, adding something to the Thursday night live programs really brought uh, uh, it really brought another element and took it to the next level. So we went after EDI, EDI. and then we went after the students, and then. I, you know, I started looking around and, the, and you kind of alluded this a little bit earlier, Jeff, about the, the power of women in sports. And you look around at the, the machine that is Carlton Athletics, you just see these amazing women running like every aspect of, uh, you know, around around Carlton Athletics and said that we would be remiss if we didn't spend some time um, and we dedicate a show to that. And um, so we're going to go to uh, to a first clip here of uh uh, Roberta again talking with uh, Jen Bredening uh, about women in sport. Your your extensive resume is an impressive feat for anyone, um, male or female. Throughout your career, I would imagine that you were in a lot of situations where you were probably the only woman in the room. Um, how did you kind of handle this? And do you have any advice maybe for, for young women looking for a career in sport? 
Yeah, so um, I would say sports come a long way um, in some regards and in others not. Um, when I was starting my career at CIAU, which is now U Sport, uh, the whole board was a board of men. Um, the topics discussed were mostly football. Uh, very little um, was discussed in terms of women's sport. And at that time, um, I don't. There was no women's rugby, and there was no women's soccer being delivered in youth sport. Um, they came on later. Uh, women's soccer was added as a women's sport in 1987, and women's rugby 1998. So, um, but uh, you know, I, how I navigated that was I got to know people. Um, some of the men in the room became my friends. Uh, you know, I. I Felt I had to work hard, prove myself uh, in order to get the respect. Um, respect doesn't come easily. You have to earn it. So uh, I just, you know, worked really hard and tried to demonstrate that I was competent and I could do the job. And then having friends that could help navigate things uh, around around the board table. But I can tell you, uh, some of the women at the time really changed the organization, and I I got to watch that. Uh, Wendy Bedingfield, who was the uh, a director at Acadia, and Kathy McDonald from Concordia, literally led the charge to change the organization to have women have the right to vote at the AGM. So we had a bylaw pass, and this is early in the in the mid '90s when uh, there was no women in the room, and uh, they had a motion where you had, to, in order to have two votes, one of the votes had to be a woman, and so that was pretty groundbreaking at that time. Um, and the other thing they had passed was um, um, a representation on committees. So you had to have a minimum of, of 40%. And so um, the men actually couldn't vote against it. They were voting on the motion, but they framed the motion in such a way that the, the men couldn't vote against it. It was brilliant. <laughs> so I got to watch all of that. And the other was uh, the OUA used to be, OUA was for men and the OWIA was the women's organization. And there was a whole amalgamation of those two organizations in the 90s. And I got to be a part of that. So There's a, a lot of seats being warmed up and a lot of in the Hall of Fame inductee ceremonies for Jennifer Brenning. Um, talk about a person that's been around forever and has been an absolute champion for Carlton. And I thought that um, she framed that really well. And she she talked from the heart in that, in that um, a lot in that episode as well. And getting her perspective, I thought was was amazing. And people want to hear from from Jennifer. She goes, she dedicates a lot of time. She's at all of the games and is a you know the biggest booster that we have. The one of the things I really liked about um, the Thursday Night Live series as it evolved was we really got to know Jennifer Brennan. And, and, you know, you think That's about that, that really stiff political clip from, from the, the first episode, which was, mm -hmm. uh, which, which was more or less reading a script or a speech. And then, and then she really poured her heart out on a number of topics as the year went on more and more. And, and uh, the amount of things that she's done. And, and, and you know, she mentioned that, that you know, when I, was at, when I was at school, women's rugby hadn't even been thought of. Like, and, and, you know, our thought then was like, how, how could women play rugby? It's too violent. And, and, and women's soccer, women's hockey sort of existed. And now uh, we've gone from women's hockey, you know, once it got in the Olympics, once women's soccer got in the Olympics, it, it kind of helped really, really grow it. And, and, and you know, look, look at now. And, and uh, uh, you've got, you know, the, the, the National Expo, the Sports Collectors Convention in Toronto happened last month. And one of the most popular autograph guests was was a, a female hockey player being inducted into the uh, into the Hockey Hall of Fame, and, and Upper Deck has done all these cards and autograph cards and memorabilia cards, and, and it's like the the platform is equal. Canada plays USA a, a, anywhere, and it sells out no matter what, and and that was never the case before. And and Trevor, mark my words, uh, within ten to fifteen years, we're going to see uh, we're going to see women's football. We're going to see women's football. Uh, played nationally, we're going to see it uh, played at the youth sports level, and, and we may even get to see sort of a grassroots pro league, kind of like what they do in women's hockey, uh, it, because because that's just that's just where it's going right now. And we'd also use that program, although we don't have a clip of it, to introduce our new um, female football coach um, at at the university. And um, I was at the the um, 
the Olympic Canadian Olympic women versus USA game here in Ottawa uh, last month, and it was packed. Uh, and I mean, if and it was like it was one of the most entertaining things that I that I've ever seen. Honestly, it was amazing. Um, the next clip um, we see Cheryl Hunt, who's been um, you know has orchestrated a lot of uh, a lot of change in marketing for for Carlton. And she's here with uh, with Shannon uh, on her team. What obstacles do you see facing women in sport today? This is a great question because I just graduated from Carleton. And in my last semester, I actually took a class called Sports and Politics, where we really dived into all the issues in sports right now. And there was a whole week dedicated to women in sport. So there are a multitude of barriers that female sports professionals experience, such as the perception of women in the media, inaccurate representation and the inability to progress within their careers. So in the research that we looked over and something that I think we can all see is that women are subject to inappropriate or stereotypical media portrayals and objectifications while simultaneously experiencing a lack of respect from the general public and male peers for their professional skills and knowledge. Women are also subject to considerations when it comes to their career, such as how they'll balance a work family life while it's not usually considered when hiring a male for a position. So as well, sports activities and professions are controlled, operated, and dominated primarily by men, which has resulted in women adapting their image and persona to appease this narrative. So it sets the example that for women to be successful and accepted, they must fit into this narrative of masculinity within sport. This conversation really did it for me because um, we, when we're trying to look at topics outside of the actual game, we have, uh, when we're talking to students who are studying this at the university and bringing that academic experience to the conversation. And people don't know, but, um, you know, Cheryl has a, a advanced graduate degree on this topic. And these guys, these two um, in this environment really blew me away. They did an amazing job on this topic. And I'm going to, I'm going to use that as a segue to the next one, which is them again, when punching up uh, another great clip. Uh, when it comes to leveling the playing field, what do you think would be, I mean, there's a multitude of steps in dismantling a thousands of years um, patriarchal sort of um, worldview. Um, but what do you think would be a, a way that we could start to level the playing field as it pertains to women in sport? For sure. And I'm happy you asked that because in that same discussion that we had in this course, we also discussed the virtuous cycle of sport, specifically how mass participation and encouragement of it reaps better athletes in the future. Um, and within that as well, we discussed how it can promote inclusion, diversity, and equality. Um, so through that, by encouraging females to participate at a grassroots level and at a younger age through this virtuous cycle of sport, um, we also increase their participation in sport, um, which will give them a more accessible path to the boardroom as well, not just as athletes, but also in a business career within sports by normalizing and increasing that visibility. But while we increase visibility, we also need to improve the portrayal of women in sport, like I previously mentioned. So in my opinion, the more female athletes, as they achieve great things and other women and girls witness this, they're more likely to recognize their own abilities, confidence and strength through that and more likely to enter this profession as well. So, but in order to do that, we need to change the content that passes that visibility gate. And in order to do that, we need to change the gatekeeper of that. I, I thought those two were absolute lightning in a bottle. I didn't see that happening. I, I knew that they were gonna have a great conversation, but they really, really nailed it and uh huge kudos to shannon too because she's she was literally like almost like day one of the role she came in and she really hit it out of the park um we're going to transition now to the season five we're already already up to season five here and this is the program that we had red circled from from the day one that we were super excited about was the olympic games and all of the the excitement and the worry and the anxiety that was going to happen around these games that were going to happen. And we really wanted to take it to the next level. And I remember um, Jeff saying in his intro and in the show, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is the, in the best, uh, the best show as far as I'm concerned. And we were so excited for it. And it was the first time that we, we literally brought in um, 
someone from outside Carlton who was an expert and and a star in his own right, um, Mark Lee, who uh, who had to at the last minute uh, decided he was going to do double duty and uh, he was going to try to help us, but he had a commitment to do the the Calgary Stampede that he's done every year for for twenty years. So he joined us from the Stampede um, before that opened. And this is a clip of him here. Thanks so much for having me on the program. It's great to be here from Calgary, where we open the uh, the Stampede tomorrow for uh, ten days of the greatest outdoor show on earth. Uh, despite COVID, they've managed to uh, get through all kinds of restrictions and uh, and get the Cowboys and Cowgirls here for competition. As regards the uh, the Olympics, um, this is going to be uh, a unique experience for me and my colleagues because of COVID. Uh, Japan uh, is apparently entering a, a fifth outbreak. Uh, and so the rules they've uh, put into into place for us to uh, to actually be on site and and call uh, the events uh, are, are quite onerous and, and for good reason. Uh, you know, only a quarter of the Japanese population has received one vaccination so far. Uh, and so for those of us going, when I leave on the 26th of July, I'll have had two tests, one 96 hours before I get on the plane, another one 72 hours after I get on, uh, before I get on the plane. As soon as we land, we're tested again. Then we go into three days of quarantine where we're tested every day. And um, kind of an uh, unusual or unnerving part of the whole process is that the Japanese um, uh, have a, an app that's been downloaded to our, our cell phones and it will track us everywhere we go. And so um, we have to stay in official uh, vehicles that get us to and from the stadium. We're only allowed to go from our hotel to the stadium and back. If we want to go to a corner store to get a, a Coke or something, um, we're allowed 15 minutes and we have to tell the security guards at the front of the hotel where we're going. Um, if we break any of those rules, uh, we're under uh, you know threat of losing our accreditation and not being able to, to work. Um, and the other, the other thing that the Japanese public is being uh, encouraged to take video and photos of uh, foreigners who may be on the streets. Uh, and they'll be posted to social media. So they're basically telling us that uh, their eyes are on us and we have to be in this very strict bubble in order to uh, to do the games. And, and I guess the other thing is that in the in the venue itself for athletics, uh, we have a three person broadcast uh, commentary booth, uh, but only two of us can sit in the booth. The middle position, which they'll all be separated by plexiglass, the middle position will have to stay vacant. And that means one of our analysts will have to go halfway around the first bend on the track we're sitting at the finish line halfway around the first bend where there's a uh, a platform for on cameras and so that that analyst will have to go there uh which means we won't have any physical contact uh, throughout the course of our broadcast so we've got some hoops to jump through but we're uh we're, we're excited to be able to go there and, and do the games uh, nevertheless Finding a short clip of Mark was really hard to do because that guy can really go. And I think one of the um, one of the things that I really wish we could have done, Jeff, and you'll agree with this for sure, is people don't see when we're preparing for these shows, having the conversations we have with guests uh, leading up to it in the weeks leading up to talk about, you know, what will this look like and how will it play out? And I, I will never forget, honestly, the time that, that Jeff and I and, and Mark spent talking on zoom calls about things uh he's like we we just got it we take a half an hour zoom call turn into an hour and a half and he'd be telling us stories about the turin olympics and the cbc staff having these you know tri playing tricks and games with each other or, or these anecdotes about different olympic games and championships he was part of and i i wish we had a bottle of that honestly and show, be able to show that all of that in, in a program because it was pretty incredible when we had uh Mark and Hugh Fraser on uh, before before the show when we had a call with with both of them, and and Hugh of course was a, a sprinter for Canada at the 1976 Montreal Olympics, and um, and then you know he he competes in the Olympics then in the Commonwealth Games and then he shows up at Carleton as a wide receiver and Mark is his quarterback, and and then uh, Hugh is a Supreme Court justice now. And and uh, was on the Dublin Inquiry, and Mark covered the Dublin Inquiry for for CBC, and 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 listening to those guys chat and reminisce, 
And, and uh, I mean, I was 12 years old and I saw Hugh Sprint in Montreal and that was kind of cool to, to talk to them about that. But, um, but to hear these guys reminisce and just go through their Rolodex of stories and, and, and common things was, uh, it, it was priceless. Well, I mean, it could have been a, it could have been a six hour episode and, and it could have been a Ken Burns documentary on, on PBS and, and there wasn't a, wasn't a slow moment. Incredible, uh, incredible uh, conversations with those guys. Yeah, we were really fortunate to be able to bring two two colleagues, two old teammates, hadn't seen each other in a long time, and put them in the same room for this. And the next clip is is those two having having that conversation. Actually, what an experience that must have been uh, when when he showed up. Now, now Hugh went on to to, to great things. Uh, you know, he he sat on the Dublin Inquiry. He was a Supreme Court justice, or is, uh, and. Um, Hugh, one one thing you know, I, I love trivia questions. So so I've got one for you to see if you know the answer because you're part of the answer, but it's, it's it's a double answer. So in the 1976 Olympics, there are two athletes from that games whose sons went on to play in the NHL, and you're one of them because your son played in the NHL. And um, do you know who the other one was? Great question. I cannot think of the answer off the top of my head. <laughs> no. Okay, so the answer is the uh, the captain of the Soviet basketball team, the women's team at that game, was was Tatiana Ovechkina, and her oh. son Alex Ovechkin oh. is the oh. other uh, athlete from that games to uh, to have a son that played in the NHL. So that's that's a pretty good tie for you to uh, Alex Ovechkin. But uh, but I'll hand it back over to to Mark because. Uh, uh, Mark, I'm sure you guys have a lot to talk about. The time at Carleton, the Dublin Inquiry, different games. Um, I'll, I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, Hugh, I, I just, first of all, it's great to see you again, Hugh. It's been too long. Um, yeah, see you, Mark. Yeah. I, I wonder, what, what, did you, what do you remember about uh, making the switch from being a, a world-class sprinter to, uh, to suiting up and, and playing football? And, and, and uh, uh, what were, the I guess, the biggest... Uh, changes you had to make or, or learn to, uh, to become a football player? Yeah, one of the things I remember distinctly is that your arm was a lot better than my hands. So, <laughs> so you, were, you could certainly fire the ball. One of the things I learned is, you know, what they talk about control speed. <laughs> like the illustration about you, you tend as a sprinter, of course, you're, you're going hard and pretty much at one speed. But, you know, I had to, to learn to adjust that speed first to, you know, you don't have to go full out all the time. So, you know, try to beat your man. But then you know you got to make your break. You got to run the pattern properly, and if you if you break off that pattern, you're useless to the quarterback. So that was a, a fairly big adjustment. And the other is the obvious one of um, you know trying to soften your hands so that when the ball comes, it doesn't clang off your fingers. You know you're being too modest because I I, I know uh, we could have run you on a fly route every play, and there's nobody who could cover you. I mean, uh, but but you make a good point about finding the finding the soft spots in the secondary. Mm. I made a great decoy anyhow for Gary. <laughs> Clear out one half of the field. So you get, well, I know get the ball defensive, to backs, defensive backs had their eyes wide open with you on one side and Gary on the other because uh, <laughs> you both you both could fly. That 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 went on and on and and it was such an honor to have those two, uh, you know, giants champions uh, on the program. It's so fun to see them. Just uh, just rapping about the time that they that they spent together uh, as Ravens back in the day, and and Mark was funny because uh, he talked about you know he takes his five step drop back and he's got a world class sprinter uh, and and he said I just threw the ball as fast as I could and as far as I could and he just ran under it and yeah. and, uh, and you know he talked about. Uh, Clearing the clearing the way for the other side was was Gary Cook, who was a, a star receiver and ended up playing uh, in the CFL and played for Ottawa in the 1981 Grey Cup. And and uh, and boy, Mark had uh, a CFL receiver on one side and a world class sprinter on the other side, and it uh, it was great. And the, and the one other thing too, Trevor, that he mentioned, uh, we didn't see the clip, but he told us that his dream as a CBC broadcaster was to call Andre de Grasse winning a gold medal. And and he got the chance to do that in the 200 meters. And, and uh, uh, one of the most, I think that'll live as one of the most iconic sports calls in all Canadian Olympic history. And, and Mark is such a professional and so talented. And 
we were blessed to have uh, to have both him and Hugh on the show. Yeah, the guys, the guys in the infield of the Calgary Stampede. He's worried about the Olympics, and he's taking a time out for us to have this chat. And it was, yeah, it was a great time. Um, switching, we decided to switch gears, and the, the word for the uh, pandemic being pivot, we pivoted to some uh, some watch parties. And the first one we did was the uh, the watch party for the uh, for the 2020 basketball championship here. What what were your thoughts heading into the game? Uh, my thought was that uh, they are a very good team, and I know some of their players, and I saw them play, you know, the last couple of years down in Halifax. So, so my 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 thing, my feeling was, who has the deeper team? And I think, uh, to me, I was what I was looking for is how much depth does Dal have, which I didn't know, and I was trying to see ascertain from the, you know, how 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 our benches would would fare, and uh, and then and then we'll we'll see as we go on uh, which team has the deeper bench. Now the the wizard behind the scenes in this broadcast is Colin Elliott, who kind of makes everything happen behind the scenes, and and, and he's the wizard like uh, Gus Williams was to the Sonics back in the day, or or we were saying he was like the Ernie D. Gregorio of of, uh, of the broadcast, kind of setting everything up for everybody. So so we'll turn it over to uh, Colin to roll the game and and uh, and enjoy the first half. of the game is that I remember Peter uh, Campbell the Laurier coach one saying to me that he wished referees had people skills first and floor mechanics second Wheeland has it this guy has charmed everyone in the building consistently since the moment he walked into it three ball attempt by Vino bounces out back underneath Capos what the hammer down I wonder let that clip run a little bit long so you could hear the crowd yelling and screaming and for me the the watch parties were about reliving the moment and hearing that crowd going crazy was a uh it was such an amazing reminiscent reminder of of like what we were missing so much is this being together in that crowd environment and, and hearing that again was really music to my ears and i'm sure a lot of alumni that that tune in for that and uh i always got got a kick of, of uh, Jeff, you know, um, using some reference for for uh, for Colin that that he clearly never heard of. I don't know if he heard of that guy, but he, he always he always suffered that. So it was pretty funny that you always did that for him, Jeff, as well. Well, you know what they say: what uh, um, what Roland Arzabald was to the band Tears for Fears, Colin is for behind the scenes production. So. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> Paul's shaking his head with, he's thinking, oh, I got to search 80s music now. Men Who's without hats fears? thing, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, so, here, here's, what, here's one from your era. What, what, what Squirtle was to mo water Pokemon, you are to behind the scenes production. How's that? Is that the, a little more timely relevant? <laughs> We're calling. So, um, of course, the uh, the end is a foregone conclusion. Uh, we we especially with basketball, you know, almost like win every year. So we know what happened there. And similarly, in the the next wa uh, watch party, that in season seven or uh, episode seven, I should say, was the Panda Tailgate Party. And um, we're going to start with a clip with uh, with Nate Bihar when he joined the program. What was your mindset going into the Panda game in 2014? How did the how did the team? Uh kind of look for that yeah I, uh, i'm sure i'll say it a million times before we're done today i kind of remember it like it was yesterday um in that you know we we put together one of the probably the most crazy psychotic mindless hard-working off seasons in history because none of us knew any better you know coach samara uh strength coach Darrell adams and all those guys they they had us working um, harder than probably many teams have ever, ever worked because, again, there was no vet there to say, hey, this is kind of crazy. We all just put our head down and went went at it. So, you know, we came back out, uh, great game in Waterloo week one. Um, kind of got to impose ourselves physically, which was a very new feeling for a lot of us, you know, 19-year-olds, some of us 20 or so. Um, and then week two was against a great McMaster team. Um, I remember they, they beat us up physically a little bit, but there were sparks, you know. Uh, we did some things on offense that we hadn't done against a team of that level. I think we ended up losing. I think we lost by three scores. I think it was probably a you know twenty or so point game, and they ran the ball down our down our throats a little bit. But going into that third game, it was Ottawa U. They disrespected us when we played um, as as freshmen in our, in our first year in every single way, and we sort of knew that this wasn't the same team. You know, this, there was something extra. You know, that we had in our 
you know, in our locker room, there was a little bit extra of that chip on our shoulder and nobody knew exactly how it was going to play out. They had a dynamic offense, which we're going to see. Um, and we knew they could put up points and all that different, all those different things, but we knew that there was a, that there was a chance. There's a real hope. It wasn't just uh, let's show up and, and hope for the best. It was like, no, no, we just, we just put some points up on Mac. It was a great football team. Uh, we've shown some things. Let's go into this and let's win this thing. Um, and luckily no spoilers. That's what we did. And, and when you look back, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, spoiler alert for the ending, but, but uh, <laughs> everybody on the broadcast know, knows what happened in the game, but I, I was, uh, I, I couldn't have been more proud and thankful for Nate Bahar for sharing his time. Here's a professional athlete for the, uh, for the Red Blacks taking time out of his schedule to join us to do this. And uh, I mean, I'm a huge Nate Bahar fan and not just as a football player, but as a person and an entrepreneur uh, with the new, you know, the firework app that he's putting out. And, um, but I never saw Nate Bahar as a television personality um, until I rewatched this. And I thought, oh, <laughs> the, like, this would be like a coming out party for Nate Bahar. This guy should be on television all the time. Yeah, he, he was absolutely fantastic and incredible wow. insight. And, and didn't, didn't it blow your mind how this is a game that was played seven years ago? And he remembered every detail of every play. Like once, yeah. once the film was rolling and he saw it, he he was like, uh, it's a, it's amazing his recall on on this stuff and and not just sort of here's what happens, but he was giving us a lot of insight, kind of behind the scenes on on how each play had developed, and it was a, it was really entertaining to listen to. It. And he will he will forever live in the annals of football, Ravens football lore. Uh, at Carlton for that catch, you know, like everybody, you remember the catch, you know, and uh, I mean, I remember being at a, a conference and he did it and everybody just went insane and, and we saw the reaction when it happened. And, and, and in terms of, yeah, his recall on it um, in terms of like what the play was called and what they were thinking and what happened. Um, that's, that's what we get to see here when he talked about it uh, in the moments leading up to the catch. And that right there was also another one because they were rallying down. We were trying to get a little bit closer so we could throw a Hail Mary and reach the end zone. And it actually slipped through Adam's hands. But it was kind of a good thing because, the you know, they had linebackers DM slowing. And if he got tackled and bounced, we were toast. It was all over. So him dropping that ball kept five seconds on the clock um, and gave us the ability or the, the chance to do this, which we called 1-4 Hank Gretzky because we called a go out a nine route. And Gretzky is 99, of course. So 1-4 Hank Gretzky is on the clock. Nick Gorgachuk sets up, throws it downfield. It's caught by Behan! It's a touchdown! Oh my goodness. Behar wins the Panda for the Carlton Ravens on a Hail Mary. And oh it, my! And it was tipped into his hands by the defensive players. They were trying to bat the ball down. They did the right thing. They knocked it down, but Behar was right there. Behar! The One of my buddies was uh, the, the official in the end zone who called the touchdown on this play. And I remember him telling me he called the touchdown. He put his hands up. He saw the bench clearing the dog pile on you. And then he saw the, the flood of students coming on the field and he said, there's like 15,000 people running toward me. And he, he just like ran away. He was terrified. But I, I, I can't, I can never not get goosebumps watching that catch and the dog pile, as you said, and this, the people streaming on the field. Like I, I still unbelievable moment in Carlton sports and to have Nate there just walking us through it. Like that was just amazing. Yeah, he he really uh, he really did a great job on it. like every play that he talked about. Um, you know, even the play leading up to the up to it. You know, here's what their linebackers were doing. It made, it's a good thing it went through his hands, and it, you know, like 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 his insight was incredible. And and uh, what a what a great uh, what a great episode that was. Yeah, and talking about like the recall, like you mentioned, like I, I'm sure he could probably tell you what he had for breakfast. Like the guy, you know, like it, it was really an incredible interview, and being able to watch the game with him was was very cool. One um, one thing yeah. Nate said, uh, 
he didn't say this during the show, but one thing he said to me, and you know, I, I think back to what we talked about a couple of episodes ago with the the equity and diversity, and and uh, I chatted with him because uh, he he coaches at Junior Ravens, and he coached a lot of the kids that I coach, and he he coached my stepson in that program too. And, and uh, we talked about, um, you know, in the aftermath of the George Floyd thing, Nate became sort of the accidental, uh, because he's outspoken, he became sort of the ac- accidental spokesman for diversity in the CFL. And, um, and I, I told him, I said, you know, one of the, one of the objectives we have when, when I coach with the Nepean Eagles is we want the kids to be colorblind and, and, and we don't want anybody to notice. And he said, you know what, that's, that's not right. He said, I want the kids to see the color and I want mm-hmm. the kids to share their culture and share their color and share their differences and diversities. And it was a complete flip from, from what we're sort of programming ourselves to think. And it's, and it's like, you know, Nate, Nate is a, is, is got a background where he's got a Jewish parent and a Jamaican parent. And, and he has, you know, he wants to embrace those cultures and share them, not, not pretend that they don't exist and everybody's the same. So it was a really different, unique, perspective and I'm really glad that Nate kind of opened my eyes to that because it was a very poignant thing for him to uh for him to address at that time he is a talented guy on a lot of fronts uh, extremely intelligent um yeah Im- ambassador material all the way so uh, we have only seen the I think the tip of the iceberg on Nate and then can't wait to have him on again sometime um so this is it we, we we're coming up to the the final episode and um like you can put the spotlight clearly on on Colin here. He and I were having um, the the entire season. We we're having this this conversation in the background about oh, it'll be really cool to be able to do like a an in person deal and do like a sports show like at a game. And and we we had dreamed about maybe doing it at the Panda game. And you know with COVID, it just it just wasn't going to happen. And then of course the soccer nationals gave us the opportunity to do that. And this is the time when we decide, okay, this is our shot. You know, we're going to take our shot and we're going to show like throw all the tricks and toys uh, at the Thursday night live. And there's a number of pictures you'll see here about where we were like scoping out uh, venues for pre-records and Jeff was on the field and setting up all this intricate um, equipment and running audio out of out of, out of a, the trunk of a car and um, you know it was super exciting for us to to take it live like the Thursday night live actually and get out there and do it um, we, we had like people rolling equipment down through tunnels and rigging and pipes and uh, and, and lighting structure and, and set designs and uh, shot sequences. And we had the, we actually had a venue in, in the field house and it was, it was really, really an amazing thing to go through. And uh, um, thanks to the Collins, as you mentioned earlier in the show, you know, his wizardry pulled together this whole thing. And, and, and once again, you have to keep in mind, like we, it's not something everything we did this year was the first time you know and for us to be able to pull it off in the way we did i think was was really um uh, i mean it's worth celebrating so i'm glad that we got a chance to talk about it again here and um this uh this clip that we're going to throw to is um when we literally pretended we were throwing it to jeff live but we couldn't do that because the tournament was going on at the time and this was part of the pre-record and the thing i want to i want to look at here that is uh that we just never stop laughing at and you know what i'm not i'm not even gonna talk about it. i'm just gonna say just watch for a, a random ball to come flying through the scene very good thank you very much jennifer and uh now let's uh, cut away to the field uh the raven's perch where old crow football alumni and host of the thursday night live the one the only jeff morris is standing by with some special guests Thanks, Jennifer and Trevor. Uh, We're up here at the Ravens Perch. I'm joined by Carlton Ravens head coach, Kwesi Loney, and Ricky Comba, a graduating player. And first, Kwesi, uh, let's go back to the game against Guelph. Uh, You guys dominated the game, a tough tough loss. Um, Is that something that the team will be motivated by, or was that a bit of something where you had to collect 
collect everybody and reset. How, how do you come off a loss like that and get ready for the Nationals? Yeah, I mean, like, like you said from the beginning, I thought we played a really good game. I mean, every uh, when you get to the semifinals, you're always going to face a tough opposition, and, and golf played well. So for us, it was just a matter of focusing on the positives from the match, looking at the areas in which we uh, maybe could have been a bit more positive, a bit better, um, and then work towards that now in this week uh, as we, as we uh, go towards the Nationals. So I, I kind of highlighted the the ball come flying through. We, we I'm still laughing about that. We how that the, the mischievous player decided like they had a really tight team. Obviously, they made it right to the final for the championship, and one of the mischievous players decides to boot the ball over to us. Probably minutes after Jeff said, "You know, I can't see what's going on behind me, and I I really shouldn't get hit by a ball." And I'm like, "Yeah, don't worry about it, Jeff. We're good." <laughs> Two seconds later, the guy boots it over. It comes sizzling through the scene. Um, as you can see by the pictures for the setup, we had, you know, tripods and all this expensive equipment set up and he literally thread the needle through it all and it crashed into the, into the dugout. And it was kind of funny to see everybody's face, try to pretend it didn't happen, but it was, it was one of those funny moments of the Thursday Night Live. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, you mentioned that I was worried about getting hit and, 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 uh, you, you know, if, if, if that was that was legitimate because um, you know not to not to bring the topic up, but I mean you probably saw from my hair in that uh, uh, in that clip that I had uh, surgery in my skull and I had a brain tumor removed and, and I'm missing about a quarter of my skull. So getting hit with a soccer ball flying at me in the head at about 70 miles an hour would be a big problem for me. And so I have my back to the practice and I was terrified. And all of a sudden this ball comes whipping by us. And, 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 you know, you try to, you try to not notice it. And, and it was like, my heart rate was uh, like, my heart was in my throat at that point, but uh, uh, we were able to, we were able to focus and keep going. And, and uh, uh, but then that was, that was a funny moment because, because, you know, like you said, it threaded the needle. How did it not knock something over? Like, like it was, it was the most perfectly placed ball that, that I've ever seen kick. It was, uh, it, it was brilliant. And that was literally five seconds into uh into our interview and we just went from there yeah you definitely handled like a, handled it like a pro um sort of gave it a quick little glance as it crashed <laughs> behind us and and uh so yeah i was on high alert after that as i thought oh my, my goodness again had the guy get hit We'd, and it was two seconds into the program which was which was pretty wild um so um we were getting sort of to the end of your segment and uh, this was a, a time when you put your signature stamp on the program, and we'll let that we'll let that uh, that clip run now. Well, we'll be, 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 before oh. we before we do that, can we can we look at uh, some of the stuff we did be, behind the scenes on that show? And, and you know, we mentioned earlier about the prep work, and and Colin has a schedule for mm -hmm. it. Can, can we can we take a look at uh, can we take a look at that? Um, oh, yeah, of course. Just because, uh, again, when we talk about how everything was broken down minute by minute, I don't think there was a, a, a better example of it than this show. Yeah, kudos to Colin. You did a, a ton of work to keep that, keep us on track. And that was the time when we, we thought, there's wow, we've really, uh, we're really, be, we're, get, we're getting kind of good at this now. And, uh, but thanks to the expertise of Colin for, for keeping us on track there for sure. And we did uh, we did a walkthrough before uh, a week before and and uh, you know I, I'm I'm wearing shorts and it, and it's because uh, we had a kind of a warm November and and lo and behold ten days later when the tournament's on it was it was it felt like like it felt like it was about minus fifty it wasn't but but I mean it mm -hmm. it got cold really quick and it's uh, it's amazing with soccer you know the the uh, uh, soccer and football the two outdoor fall sports you never know what you're going to play in. And you've got to be prepared to play in any weather, and and, uh, um, and that was uh, uh, it, it's amazing just the just the swing in ten days and how it can affect the broadcast. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So we'll uh, we'll throw to that clip um, in which uh, uh, we've got uh, you and Lanos and and you uh, nailing down your your signature call. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks for joining. Great us. seeing you again, brother. It really is. Okay. Thanks. And that was uh, Carlton Ravens Hall of Famer, Mike Lanos. So everybody put your seats back and your tray tables down and relax and enjoy the next couple of days. We're gonna throw it back to the field house to the climate controlled warmth where we've got Jennifer and Trevor standing by. Thank you very much, Jeff. Absolutely fascinating stuff there. And 
thanks for the reminder to get those uh, tra tree tables way up. We are indeed on the runway and set to take off here at Nationals. You know, watching that piece, you, you can't say enough and so thankful for all the efforts of our coaches and alumni here. And, and Jennifer, Jennifer, you've known some of these people for a, a very, very uh, long time. So what comes to mind and, and the perspectives in, in terms of that piece that you saw? Well, both Mike Hoffler and Mike Lano spoke about brotherhood, spoke about um, their long lasting friends and lifelong memories. And, and I think our student athletes don't realize it right now because they're living it. But when they graduate, um, you talked about community, you talked about commitment for life, which is in our creed. Uh, it is truly that uh, once they graduate, um, they, these, these are going to be memories of a lifetime, friendships for a lifetime. And so that's what university sport is all about. It's not just about wins and losses. It's about, you know, the pride of your institution and, and coming back um, and that real sense of community that you talked about earlier. And, and you really get a, a sense of the pride uh, when they stand on that hollow ground on the field yeah. and they start those memories start flooding yeah. back and I'm sure we'll see a lot of that here this weekend absolutely so, so your, your thoughts on on that Jeff her, her friendly comments on, on the program that that was uh you know she, what she talks about with people coming back and and uh, uh it was great to chat with Mike Lanos and and I got to know him a little bit when I went to uh Carleton we were there at the same time and and uh when I saw him, it was like, uh, I said, Mike, you realize we haven't spoken since the Reagan administration. <laughs> like, like, like to put it into perspective, it was the athletic banquet in 87. That's the last time I saw you and chatted with you because I congratulated you on, on winning an award. And, and uh, um, it's amazing how, you know, that many years can go by. Um, but, but you know what, that 1984 team that lost in the final on penalties, uh, most of those guys were there, and and they're there supporting the team, and and that championship served as a as a as a platform for a reunion for those guys, as it did for another a number of other Carlton teams too. So so that having having hosting that championship, I mean, you know, I know Carlton lost in penalties in the in the gold medal game, but um, when time goes by, uh, that final, you know, scoring a goal with five seconds left in extra time to take it to penalties. That's probably the most exciting moment in, in Carleton soccer history. And, and uh, uh, what a thrill to have that at home. And, and, and you know what, you hate losing, but I mean, in penalties, it's like, you can't really call that a loss because it's almost like, you're almost playing rock, paper, scissors. It's, 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 it's a side national championship. So, so uh, you know, I, I hope our guys see themselves as championship champions, even though they, they come home with silver medals on that. And, and they, stood, they stood on their field and, and they put a medal around their neck um, as the, I don't know if they're the fifth or sixth seed coming in. Um, all the teams in the country that wanted to be at the championship and they got there and they stood on the field with a medal around their neck and um, not the one they wanted, but it was quite an accomplishment. We were, we are, as you say, we're very, very proud of them. This was a clip that, uh, that I chose specifically because it did talk about Raven's pride and she talked about um, the sense of, of community, and it's a word that we use a lot. And um, the Thursday Night Live this year, it was it was an honor to be able to stitch together that uh, the pride and the community together virtually for people, and be able, for us to be able to bring all, like all of these people. We've had hundreds of people that have tuned in over the course of the year to to, to feel that sense of pride again. It was a real honor to, to be able to, to deliver that, and I hope that we can. We can give people more in, in 2022. And before we wrap up, uh, Jeff, I'll, I'll let you have the final word as the MC extraordinaire for the Thursday Night Live. <laughs> well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed the flight and uh, be sure to put your tray tables up and your seat back in the upright position. Uh, don't forget your belongings that are stowed uh, under, your, under your seats and uh, we'll see you next time. And, uh, and thanks for flying Air Ravens.